God bless y'all. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, again, we're going to be continuing our study with the minor prophets, major messages from the minor prophets. We're continuing in our study in Hosea. And before we get started, let's get ready to uh, pray and let's seek the Lord for a blessing upon our study. Our Father and our God, we want to bless you and thank you for all your goodness, all your grace, and all your mercy. Father, we thank you that you are so good. You've been so good. You are being good. And we know that you will be good. Father God, we ask that you bless us today as we study your word together. Let the spirit of the living God guide us and direct us into your truth. And let that truth be crystallized in our lives that people may see your goodness by seeing how we treat one another and how we walk in this evil world, praising God with everything that we have. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, beloved, I want to welcome you. We are doing our study, major messages for the minor prophets. We're looking at the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament, starting out with the book of Hosea. Amen. In our study, follow me something with these things. Okay. In our study, we'll cover all of September, all of October, November, and one week in December. Last week, we talked about the share of God's pain. If you know the story of Hosea, Hosea was called as a prophet of God to marry an unfaithful, adulterous woman, bring her into his home. She ran away from him, and he was told to go get her to symbolize God's relationship with idolatrous and wayward Israel. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's us too. God had to come back and get us. So we talked about last night, Last week, rather, a share in God's pain, how our sin, how our shortcomings, how our disobedience grieves the heart of God. But, you know, tonight we want to talk about the vision of what's possible. And I love that, y'all, because no matter how far we've fallen, it is possible to still receive God's blessings. Is there anybody here, anybody listen tonight that has fallen and has received God's merciful blessings? You ought to give God praise in your house. Amen. Amen and amen. So tonight's lesson, major messages from Bible prophets, God's persistent love is a vision of what's possible. We're going to pick up in chapter two at verse 14, all the way down to chapter three, verse five. And the purpose of this lesson is to see God's passion and to see God's persistence in coming after and bringing hope to people when they messed up so bad it might seem like they're hopeless. Amen? I'm glad as long as we have God, we have hope. Aren't you glad about that? So let's do a quick review of the book of Hosea, shall we? Uh, we know that in the Old Testament, there are four major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, there's a book of Lamentations that goes along with the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. 
And then there are the 12 minor prophets, Hosea all the way down to Malachi. Now, the difference between the major and the minor prophets is only a question of volume. Their messages are still the word of God. Even though these minor prophets didn't write as much, they, they still wrote the word of God. And we ought to obey it, heed it, and follow it. Amen? Amen. Now, as we look at the writing of the prophets, amen, all of these prophets wrote during different periods of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Listen, they warned them, if they continued in idolatry, God will bring correction. And, and that correction came in the form of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They were taken into captivity, put on time out, if you will, for some 70 years until God restored them. And then these other prophets talked about God's promises of bringing them back. Oh, I, what I love about God, he is a restoring God. He is a God who, even though we've made mistakes, even though we've blown it big time, he will bring us back. Some of us are some comeback kids here listening tonight. You ought to put in, in the chat, I'm a comeback kid. Amen? Amen. Well, so specifically, the introduction to the book of Hosea goes this way. Hosea was a son of Berah. We don't know much about him, but we do know that Hosea was called to be a prophet at an early age. He prophesied, beloved, from 755 to 725 BC. That means he had a 30-year prophecy ministry. Amen? And he saw many kings. He saw God's working in their lives. He warned them about what God was going to do and gave them the promises of what God would do when they would repent and return to him. The purpose of his writing through the word picture or the life picture of his relationship with his adulterous wife, Gomer, was to remind Israel and to remind us that God's loving covenant with his people is unwavering. Listen, we may change, we may blow it, we may mess up on our side, but God always keeps his promises. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we have a promise-keeping God. He loves us with an unconditional, everlasting love. And that don't mean much to you unless you've blown it, unless you messed up, unless you failed in some way, amen, and God brought you back. The application of this wonderful book is this way. Hosea shows us God's unconditional love, but it also shows us how God feels when we sin against him. Listen, beloved, when we sin, listen, I need you to hear me. When we sin against one another, we ultimately sin against God. And it grieves his heart uh, because he can't bless us the way he wants to bless us when we're in sin like that. And when we do sin, here's the good news, if we repent, God will bring us back and continue to show his everlasting love toward us. Amen. First John 1 John 1.9 says, We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news for somebody out there today. And as we remember, listen, as we remember, as we were singing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are better than good. I owe you my life. But every door you open, every way you made, every time you healed us, we remember all the good that God has done for us in Christ. Our beloved will rejoice. I will be even more motivated to walk in obedience to a God that loves us so much. When we understand that all of us, no matter how good we think we are, all of us deserve to be burning in the devil's hell right now if it had not been for God's grace and God's mercy. Amen. So, Really quickly, the uh, backdrop of the story of Homer and his wife Gomer. Hey, I'm sorry, Hosea and his wife Gomer. Gomer was the unfaithful wife of Hosea the prophet. God told him to marry her, even though he knew she would be unfaithful and adulterous. God gave Hosea an unusual command: Go marry a promiscuous woman for an adulterous wife. Uh, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. He was showing Israel that just as Gomer was unfaithful to a loving husband, they were unfaithful to their loving God. 
After bearing three children, Gomer left Hosea to live with another man. But God commanded Hosea, we'll talk about this tonight, to buy her back. Amen? Anybody here to see? See, there's a song, beloved Renee, we used to sing in our church. I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed my life. If anybody asks you just so I am, I'm redeemed, right? And we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. This is a beautiful picture of that, Amen? And then the Lord used their relationship to show how God remains faithful even when his people don't remain faithful. So that's really the story of Hosea in a nutshell. So last week, we talked about how God commanded Hosea to marry this adulterous woman knowing that she would be unfaithful as a vivid picture of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. And if we look at our nation, if we look at sometimes our churches, there's been a lot of unfaithfulness to God. Amen. Uh, people have been forgetting about God, going back into the world. Some of the same sins we see out in the unbelieving world sometimes creep their way into the church. Uh, there's things we promise we do for God, but we let those promises go and allow our flesh to take over. But God is in the business of restoring us and bringing us back. And that's what we're going to be talking about in tonight's lesson. So we're going to look at Hosea chapter 2. Verses 14 to 23, the end, the end of the chapter. So I apologize in advance, y'all. Some of the notes I sent y'all earlier were a little bit uh, out of order, and I will send corrected notes at the end of this study. But here it is. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Hosea chapter 2, and follow along as we read from the NIV version. Here's God speaking. Therefore, I am going to alert her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the name of Baals from her lips. No longer will her names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword and battle. I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, and the new wine, and the olive oil. They will respond to just real. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I call, not my loved one. I will say to those, not my people, you are my people. And they should say, you are my God. All that's good news is God talking, y'all. God's talking about how he's going to restore his wayward people. All that's good news today. Amen. And so here it is. The first question we have here, I want to kind of summarize. See, what I love about it, if you look at Hosea's uh, uh, language throughout chapter two, it is poetic. It is Language that's full of word pictures, if you will. Very poetic. But we can summarize what God is talking about. Amen? As to what he wants to do with his people. Uh, he wants to give them, y'all, a vision of hope. Uh, Minister Allison and I were praying today about the church building. And we were praying at one point that was a thought. Then it became a plan on paper. Now it's a building we can walk in, touch, and feel, and, and stand in. And we're hoping a vision of seeing that church open in God's time. And so here it is. As we look at God's hope, the vision that we see, even though we don't see it now, hope is what we don't see now, but we're sure because of how good God is. The vision of hope of passionate reconciliation. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, later on in the lesson. But God gives his people the hope that he will passionately pursue reconciliation. God doesn't leave us out there. He will passionately come back for us. Amen? I love that. 
It gives them a vision of prosperity, restoration. God gives his people hope that whatever material things they lost, they will be restored. Amen. God not only restores our spiritual needs, but God will restore our physical needs as well. This very house that I'm standing in is a result of a God who restores y'all. Amen. That's all y'all need to know about that. The vision of hope and prophetic revelation. What do you mean, Pastor? The example of Hosea and Gomer is the hope that all Israel and ultimately all people in the world will be redeemed, will be restored, will be reclaimed through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, listen, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Isn't that a beautiful picture about how God came down from heaven, walked the earth among us, died on a rugged cross to redeem us and buy us back to himself. That's why they call his dying on the cross, amen, the passion of Christ, right? And we talked about this uh, last Sunday in our uh, Back to Church Sunday sermon, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I have for you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. Listen, we ought to be a hopeful people even when right now it might look hopeless in your life. God has passion. God has your prosperity. And God has prophetic revelation for you that things are not always going to be as they are right now. Be in hope, beloved. No matter what it looks like, hope in God. Psalm 42 is the hope of our countenance. So, with that, God is wanting them to see hope. He's wanting them to see, even though they're in a hopeless state, he wants to bring them to hope. But that hope only comes when we're willing to change. Got it? I was watching uh, Rocky 2. And Rocky, in Rocky 1, his eye got messed up. Rocky's a left-handed fighter. So in order for him to have any chance of winning the fight against Apollo the second time, Mickey said, you got to change everything. You got to change from being a right-handed fighter, to a left-handed fighter, rather, to fighting right-handed. Amen? And Rocky said, I, I, I can't do that. And Mickey says, there ain't no chance. You got to change. And so in order for us to see God's blessings of hope, we got to change. And God's hoping for changes uh, to see his blessing come to pass. Amen? And so he's asking them to have a change in their passion. Verse 15 in chapter 2, they will respond as the Israelites responded when they came out of Egypt. Listen, some of us need to go back to when God first saved us. We need to go back to when God first brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need to go back and have a renewal of our vows to the Lord. Amen. And be just as passionate in the beginning of our service as we are right now. Amen? He's looking for a change in their recognition. God says, you won't call me master. I won't be lording over you per se. But we have an intimate relationship as husband and wife. Amen? We will be the bride of Christ and he will be the groom. That kind of intimacy, that kind of love relationship, that kind of belonging to each other. Listen, beloved, I need to let you know if you're watching and listening tonight, you belong to God. You are his prized possession. You need to recognize that. A change in their devotion. He tells them he's going to remove all the idolatry out of their way. They'll no longer uh, have bail on their lips like basket bail. Foot bail, base bail, amen, shopping bail. We won't put anything above or equal to our God, amen? We will give our all. He's looking for us to give our all to Christ. Listen, beloved, we need to come back to these changes, especially after two years of the pandemic. We've gotten too comfortable. We've gotten too casual. We need to change, come back to where we used to be before the pandemic, right? Got one more. 
He's asking for a change in their adoration. He says, he says, look, you'll be my people and you will respond, you are my God, meaning that we will love him above everything else. We'll come to worship. We'll give our offerings. We'll give our time in ministry. We will lift our hands. We will shout unto God. We will passionately give him our worship because he is our God. There's nobody else to worship. Nobody else who saved us. He is our God. Nobody else. So many doors you've opened. So many ways you've made. Because you are my God, we want to give you the best of our praise. Amen? Amen. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus himself had a critique of an Ephesian church that was a good church, but they had lost their first love. B.B. King put it this way, the thrill was gone. The thrill was gone away. And the Bible says you left your first love. Remember what you did before. Remember before the pandemic. Remember before the issues, before all of that, how we were giving our all to God. And God wants us to continue and do what we did before and even more. Amen. We need to come back to church in the same numbers, greater numbers, be more just as committed Listen, everybody who's listening and breathing needs to be on this Bible study tonight. Amen? Not because of me, because you love God. Got it? Amen. We got to change. It's, it's called in the word repentance, y'all. So, as we move on, and this, this part right here, Sister Vicky, made me shout as I was studying this out. See, 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 see. When, when, when you... Find that special person, the one that you swipe right on, amen, on Tinder, right? When you find that one that you want to get with, amen, uh, 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 on the day that you were born, the angels got together, decided to create a dream, dream come true. I just want to be close to you. When you find that person, uh, you want to take steps to get with them, amen, and see, God has found us, and he, and he loves us, and he, and he, and listen, he's talking about hope, but he, in the scripture, shows that he's going to be the one that's going to take the steps to bring us back to him. I, I, I love this part. See, there's personal indications, right? Look at the scriptures. God uses personal pronouns and verbs in verses 14 to 23. He says, I am, I will. It indicates he takes reconciliation with his people personally. Amen? He is personally engaged and involved in coming after his children, in blessing his children, in being with his children. God will bring you back because he loves you. It's a personal thing to God. Amen? And then his personal actions. He doesn't just say, I will. But then he declares the different actions he's going to do. He will redeem. Like he will allure her in verse uh, 14. He will woo her, if you will. Amen. He will lead her. He will make a covenant with her or us. And he will show his way with children his love. Anybody here knows that God loves you? Has God shown his love to you today? Let me give you a hint. If you woke you up this morning, that's a touch of his love. If you can breathe, see, walk, and talk, that's a touch of his love. If you know you're saved and going to heaven, that's a touch of his love. If he protected you on these crazy highways, that's a touch of his love. And if you're listening by the Spirit to what I'm teaching you today, that's him wooing you to be redeemed and come back to him. And then there's personal motivation, y'all. Hey, Amen. God's not this, this uh, robotic creature who has no emotion or no affection. He shows his motivation. He said, I will betroth you. I will marry you. Amen. 
And he used the word to me forever. Amen. There's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Nothing you can do to get him to make him kick you out of his family. He will betroth you in faithfulness, righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. And these things are regardless of our mess ups and regardless of our hang ups. And as we say in preaching school, who would want to serve? A God like that. Who, who wouldn't want to worship? See, the Muslim gods and these other guys don't love like that. Because they can't. Because they're idols. We say, we should say, uh, 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 beloved, he's my Lord and my personal Savior. Amen? Things personal. To God and personal toward us. That's good news. See, doesn't make you shout. Doesn't make you want to shout. Okay, let's get, get to the next one here. Now, here it is. And the last thing that we study, Gomer's three children were all given names that indicated God's displeasure with Israel. And these things are hard, y'all. God, in verse 22 and 23 of chapter 2, however, God changes the names or changes what he's going to do, even though those names are kind of indicating his displeasure. Or in other words, you are called one thing, but God is reversing that and calling you something else for his glory. Got it? So he says restoration. Jezreel was a valley where... Uh, the king Ahab uh, stole some land, amen, and God punished all of the kings of, of, of Israel and their descendants. But now God is restoring uh, their position and provision. Reconciliation. He said, look, I don't love you anymore. He gave him that name. But God will once again show his love toward Lou Rama and reconcile with them. And then reversal. And this is the part that I like, y'all. God reverses their status. He said to the last child, you are not my people, but God's reversing them. They are now his people. And listen, God's mercy changes everything. Let me break it down so we can understand this. Some of us have been called liar, but God's mercy changes it. Some of us have been called adultery. But God's mercy changed it. Some of us have been called drug addict or drunkard, but God's mercy changed it. Some of us have been called thief or a person in prison, but God's mercy changed it. Some of us were sick and about to got, die, but God's mercy changed it. Some of us were unemployed and God's mercy changed it. Some of us were homeless, but God's mercy changed it. Some of us are broke, busted, and disgusted, but God's mercy changed it. Your grace and mercy brought me through. God changes it by his mercy. Is it Sunday yet? So when we understand his mercy, the psalmist writes, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us. He's our God. We're his people. The people he loves to show mercy toward. The people he loves to provide for. The people he will restore and lead them in the green pastures. We are the sheep of his hand. And when we recognize that, and when we realize that, we we'll always have hope in his mercy. The psalmist writes in Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life because the shepherd's out in front. Amen. Leading the sheep. But goodness and mercy are like two sheep dogs that follow us. Keep the wolves from messing with us. Thank God for his grace and mercy. Thank God for his goodness and his mercy. Amen. Amen. That's the first half of our lesson here about God's mercy and grace and the hope he gives us. Now we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. 
where God will command Hosea. Gomer has had these two children. And then Gomer has taken off, Hosea's wife, has taken off, went to another land to live with another man, to be involved in adultery and maybe even prostitution. And God commands Hosea, go back and get her. And don't just get her. You won't be able to just take her. You're going to have to spend some money to buy her back. Amen. And so he does that. And we see how that works out spiritually for us as we think about how God brought us back today. So turn again in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And in the NIV version, you will find these words, hopefully. <laughs> then the Lord said to me, go show love to your wife. Again, though, oh, listen, y'all, don't you love by another man? And is an adulteress. Love her, listen, as the Lord loves the Israelites, as the Lord loves South Rock, as the Lord loves your children, as the Lord loves Republicans, as the Lord loves Democrats, as the Lord loves independents, black people, white people, Chinese people, or Samoans. Love her. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raising cakes. In other words, the sacrifices given to other gods. So I bought her it is Hosea for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a thick of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or intimate with any other man and I will behave the same way toward you. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice of sacred stones, without eat foul or household gods. Afterwards, Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Here it is, beloved. Don't you see the beautiful picture here? Here it is. Gomer is taken off. We don't know how long she was gone. She was gone long enough to live with another man in an adulterous relationship. Uh, God gives Noah another unusual command to go back and get his wife. Go back, not just get her, but go back and love her as you did before. As a word picture, as a life picture to show how God loves even wayward children, amen? So, Hosea, you got to admire Hosea, beloved, especially for the men today. You got to admire Hosea. Now, now, see, listen, God ain't calling us to do that in the New Testament, got it? But he, you got to admire Hosea. He, he was given some difficult commands and he didn't question God. He didn't argue with God. He didn't wrestle with God. We don't see it in the scriptures, but he just obeyed. Did what God told him to do. And beloved, we would just have that kind of attitude. Just be obedient to whatever God says. Amen. We will find out, no matter how difficult it is, we'll find out it'll work out for our good and his glory. So, in the first chapter, he told him to go marry an unfaithful wife, have children by her, and give them names that will indicate that they will be unfaithful and, and walk this marriage out. In the sight of all Israel, he's a pastor, preacher, and he got an adulterous wife. So look, now he commands Hosea to do this, to go buy her back. And here's a breakdown of those commands. He commands, so these are difficult commands, y'all. To reconcile with her. Hosea is to actively pursue her with the goal of reconciling with her, even though he knows she's been sinning against God and against him in adultery and possibly prostitution. And he's called to reconcile. And beloved, let me say this while it's on my mind. You know, some of us have trouble reconciling the people that are right next to us in church. When people haven't even done this, just because they might have said something or overlooked you or maybe not called out your name, we don't want to reconcile. We have the ministry of reconciliation. And he's called, beloved, to redeem her. He is asked to buy Gomer back. Listen, sacrificing from his own resources 
to pay someone else for his wife. Wow. Someone else for property. I wouldn't say property, but for someone who belongs to him by covenant. Got it? Some of us won't swallow our pride. We'll get to that in the next point. Some of us won't swallow an injustice. Some of us won't let the past go. Because we feel like it costs too much. But we look like, look at Jesus and what he paid to redeem us. And then he said to Hosea, we dedicate to her. Hosea is called and commanded to recommit to her and reestablish the marriage covenant. Listen, even though he was not at fault. Got it? And if you're a Bible reader, if, you're experience, if you have ever experienced the salvation and love that God brings, this is an easy thing for you to figure out. Hosea and Gomer's relationship is a vivid picture of God's redeeming work with a sinful, idolatrous people of Israel. And I ran out of space here. But even with a sinful, idolatrous people today. Got it? We were, we were Gomer. Amen? And God forgave us. Redeemed us. Dedicated to us. But we need to dedicate ourselves to him. Reconcile with one another. Now, here it is, y'all. Now, Hosea gave up money, a bunch of shekels, a lethic of barley and grain. I don't even know what a lethic is, y'all, but it sounds like a lot. Amen? Uh, he had to give up time. He had to give up convenience. And he had to travel to buy her back, experiencing some of the quote-unquote embarrassment and the naysaying of people. Can you imagine if they had Facebook back then? Amen. Folks would be going crazy talking about Homer and Hosea and Gomer. I mean, it would, people would be, man, Facebook and Twitter would have, would have kind of had to shut down with all the stuff that people were saying. But he gave up money, gave up time, and gave up reputation. But when you look in the verses, he would also have to give up some other things in order to make this thing work. One of the things he had to give up is resentment. Although he could be rightfully resentful of what Gomer had done to him, right? He would have to put away his anger, put away his uh his, his disappointment and put away his, his, his embarrassment and watch this y'all and show unconditional love to his wayward wife. See, in, in, they got into an argument. He couldn't bring it up again. Got it? He would have to give up resentment and he'd have to give up revenge. He had to give up unforgiveness. He couldn't hold a grudge. And he couldn't continually rehearse Gomer's failures. Women married folks, you listen to some married folks say amen. Man, if somebody does something wrong and they ask for forgiveness, we ought not bring it up again. When you haven't fallen out. Got it? That's not forgiveness. Love, as Paul wrote, doesn't keep records of wrongs. Love puts it away. It doesn't keep it in the quiver. So it can be shot at somebody later on. And here it is. He would also have to give up self righteousness. He would have had to give up any pride that would make him think that even though he wasn't adultery, even though he was faithful, 
that he was better than good. Got it? At least I didn't. At least I didn't do what you did. Listen, none of us, but there's some of us who don't want to hang around people because they did this or that in the past. I don't want to hang around folk, amen, who, who, who sinned like that. If that's the attitude, there wouldn't be anybody in the church. Uh, starting with the pastor. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. And no, not you. There, but for the grace of God, you would have done the same thing, or worse. And while you may not have done it physically, you've done it in your mind and in your heart. God sees all of that. We need to get, a, get away from our resentment and, and stop trying to seek revenge and stop trying to walk in self-righteousness when we see other people fall or when we hear about other people's failures. Amen. When we walk in humility and grace to restore people bring them back into the fold, help God clean them up. And, and, and Paul makes this abundantly clear in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be, he's talking to the church. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Remember that guy who was forgiven uh, in Luke? Uh, from a king for millions and millions of dollars. Then he saw his fellow worker who owed him like 20 bucks, grabbed him up in the collar, amen, put him in jail, forgetting about everything that God had done for them. That's why we started our lesson today with, Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. You redeemed me. So many doors you've opened. We should never forget all that God has done for us. And we wouldn't be so hard on people when they make mistakes. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Two words that help a church. Forgive me, and I'm sorry, and I'll forgive you. Amen? Even as Christ forgave us. So, as you wind down here to question number seven, the Valley of Achor, was a serious place of defeat for the Israelites when they conquered, after they conquered Jericho. They went into the city of Ai and, and they, they took uh, the city, but one of the people uh, took some things that belonged to the Lord. And in that valley, they, they had a serious defeat. Uh, it, it, was, it was defeat. And so God reminds him of that. But he also reminds them that God can take the spiritual defeat and turn it in to a place of hope. Amen. Listen, that's how Romans did Baptist Church. Some of us have experienced some defeat. People pushed us out, talked about us, called us everything but a child of God, wrote letters. God took that defeat and created a new body, a new place of hope that we're building out there in the Edge Mount community, and we want to express that hope to everyone who will hear. What I love about God, he can take your greatest defeat. He can take what the devil tried to do to, to, to destroy you and turn that thing around and make it. Anybody here glad that God can turn around? Anybody here have a turnaround testimony in your life? Amen. You ought to say, I've got a turnaround testimony. And so how does God Create from a place of defeat into a place of hope. I'll tell you how he does it. He does it by his power. Listen, despite what we've been through, despite our own personal issues, despite the things that people have done to us, and even despite the things we've done to ourselves, God's power can turn things around for our good and for his glory. Is anybody here glad that God's power can turn your situation around? Look back over your life and see how God's power turned it around.
He turned it by his power. He can turn defeat into hope by his power, but also by his promises, y'all. See, everything that is providing hope is based on stuff that God had already promised. See, even though he promises discipline, and the discipline is going to come, he also promises restoration in due season. And that's a hope, God. We, we don't serve a God who just throws us away. He, if he disciplines us, we have the hope of restoration. Amen? It's ultimately going to be for our good. But he doesn't keep his anger forever. His, his, his punishment only lasts for a season, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Listen, when we would just reflect, stand on, remember, recite, and rehearse God's promises, it will give us hope, despite what the news is saying, despite what the naysayers are saying, despite what your neighbors are saying. God's promises are yes. Yes! We need to say amen. That amen fills us with hope. And then this, this thing here, God's providence. See, God's providence, God, God's providence is him working in natural events to bring about his supernatural purpose. In other words, God is able to take every good thing and even some of the bad stuff. And by his providence, Make it work for his good purpose. I, I, sometimes God's providence would take the stuff that people try to do to you. And he'll turn it around for your good in his glory. He'll use that to bring a blessing to you. God's providence will, will keep you from accidents by delaying you longer than it takes to get to your destination. God's providence will have a handful of fries in the bottom of the McDonald's bag after you've eaten your meal. That's God's providence. Everything that happens to us, God takes it, molds it, and he works it. And we might have hope. So we have a God that will do that for us, no matter what things look like. And so I'm going to leave this scripture with you. Y'all know this one. Amen. And we know, <laughs> Romans chapter 8, all things. Work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, you've been, if you, you've been in Christ, and you're, you're the called of God, amen. You can know that every good thing, every bad thing, everything that people try to do to you, every, every stupid mistake be made, God can use that to bring hope. It, it, it won't negate God's love and purpose. In your life, amen. He can take your biggest defeat and turn it into hope. Well, now how I know? Because God took the cross, the hill called Calvary, where his son was nailed, and everybody thought that that was a place of defeat. But it turned out to be the place of the greatest victory victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the devil, victory over the grave. Amen. Amen. That's our lesson tonight, beloved. Just a few more things to talk about when we, when we see hope that I'm talking about, the vision of hope, when we know that we serve a God of hope, it doesn't come to us as we are standing still. When we know that we have a God of hope, it moves us to take some steps of action. You know, when I used to catch the bus in Philly and in Harrisburg, I knew what time the bus was coming at the stop. So I would have my happy hips out there, standing at the stop before the bus got there because I had hope that the bus would make it and make it on time. I had to have my happy hips out there in order to catch the bus I had to, because I was filled with hope. That it must come. And so there are some steps of obedience and trust that we can always be in 
to God's hope. We can be moving toward the hope that God has for us. These are just some things that, that, that uh, came to my mind as I talked about that. And, and we see some of that in Matthew 22. Uh, uh, to break it down, Jesus uh, showed us how to keep our hope with God solid. And we do that by obedience and trust. And so there's two commandments that he points out. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. And also, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you think about the Ten Commandments, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's the first table. Loving your neighbor as yourself, that's the second table. And you can't really do one without the other. So here it is. Uh, there's some steps here. You got to love the Lord. Love, your, love the Lord. And the way you show your love for him is by obeying him, praising him for everything he's done for you, loving the Lord, expressing your heart in worship, expressing your heart in obedience. And then here it is. You got to love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is anybody you come in contact with. Amen. Love your neighbor, love your friends, love your families. And, and listen, this loving includes forgiveness. Amen? It says loving includes forgiveness for when they've done wrong. Right? Amen? There's no way you can love without forgiving. And listen, there's no way you can forgive without loving. Monica, if you listen, tweet that. There's no way you can love without forgiving. And there's, there's no way you can forgive. I love it. Here's some more prayer. Amen. We need to talk to God to let him know what's on our heart because he already knows that. But also asking him for the things we need, thanking him for the things he's given, and asking him to show us the way and his will for our lives. Got it? You won't obey God without praying to God. Amen? You won't be obeying him. You won't do what he says if you're not hearing what he's saying to you, if you're not in constant communication with him. And you don't have to have fancy prayers. Just talk to him like your father. Or if you're looking for the words to pray, go to the Psalms. Uh, pray some of those. Amen? Talk to him. And here's a big one. Here's the thing. Prayer is talking to God. But here's how God talks to you. Beloved, you got to read your Bible. Amen? You got to know what God says about himself, his character, his will, his precepts and principles, and his promises. And you got to read the Bible to know what God says about you, about who you are in him, how I preached last Sunday. We're more than conquerors. We're not defeated. Amen? We're not oppressed. Well, we are conquerors. We are children of the Most High God. You got to read the Bible to find that out. Amen? Listen, you, you can't tell me a person who reads the Bible won't stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen? And But then here's, here's one that I added, y'all. You got to be a part of worship and service. And this has been a big challenge for us since the pandemic. Right? Um... We, we lost a lot of things. Uh, you know, they were shut down. We were put on hold for a minute. But now, as you look at the last part of chapter uh, 3, verses 4 and 5, since God allowed those things to be taken away, now is the time. Look at verses 4 and 5. Now is the time for us to recognize God's blessings, to recognize his goodness, recognize the hope he has for us, and run to him. This is not the time, listen, I love online worship. I'm glad when I was sick, I'm glad we had it. But I'm telling you, y'all, now is the time for us to run to worship. Now is the time to run to the church to be with the saints and to be with God. And we need to serve the Lord. Amen? Listen, God, listen, listen, listen. We need to spend our time, our money, our resources in serving God and his mission. Listen, we have a mission to accomplish. And we need everybody. This Sunday for our outdoor service, we need everybody to show up 
Help us lay some of these chairs down to greet the people as they come. Some of us need to witness the folks who need to know Jesus. We need to be able to point them to that building and say, we're coming. We need people to serve, to be a part of what God is doing. It's all summed up in this command. Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Amen? Amen. That's our lesson tonight. God is a good God. He's a God of hope. He's a God who loves us. He's a God who will, who will uh, restore us. And he has a hope for us. Amen. That, that the world can't give. And beloved, the world can't take away. Real quick, let's give us our keys for living. Here's some good news, y'all. No matter how deep our failures, we can always have the hope that God will never, ever abandon us. Despite your failures, you can't go so low that God can't pick you up. You can't go so far that God can't come and bring you back. Despite our failures, we have hope in God. And even when we fall into sin and its consequences, our loving God, listen, he'll move heaven and earth. He'll move people. He'll move everything out the way to come after you because you belong to him. Just as God brought us hope and salvation and eternal life from what seemed like Jesus' defeat on the cross, we can hope in his turning defeat and the victory in our lives. Oh, that's good news, y'all. That's good news. And I just want to leave you with this pericope. 1 Peter 5, 10. The God of all grace, he will restore. He will confirm and strengthen and establish Y-O-U. Oh, listen, be hopeful tonight. Be, be hopeful tonight. Uh, if it be your, the Lord's will uh, tomorrow as he opens your eyes, wake up with hope. Amen? Wake up with hope. Be, be prisoners of hope today. Watch God work out things. Now, like, I'm hopeful today. Our God is on our side. Amen. We are on his side. Moment of silence, and then we'll pray. Our Father, our God, we love you tonight. We thank you that you indeed are the God of not just some hope, but you're the God of all hope. And that hope is sure, that hope is steadfast, that hope is everlasting. Lord God, forgive us for the times when we haven't given our all to you, when we've allowed the world to entice us, to cause us to uh, fold our arms in, in comfort and in, 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 in idleness, and we should be up, moving, working on kingdom business. Father, I pray you would energize us with your hope tonight. And it is so under the sound of a voice who feels hopeless, who feels like everything is against them. God, let this message crystallize in their hearts. You indeed are the God of all hope, and you will lift us up in due season. Thank you for loving us. Bless our time together. Bless our service on Sunday. Bless every home represented here today, Lord. Let there be a home of hope with Jesus Christ. We love you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Again, beloved, thank y'all for tonight's Bible study. Thank you. Share this with somebody. And again, uh, this Sunday, join us at the Edgemount Community Park at 10 o'clock in the morning. Amen. We need most of us to show up at 9 to help set things up. Uh, we're going to be in the community showing the hope and love of Jesus Christ. God's good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So let's Let's show up and show out for God and watch God work in our lives. God bless y'all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face and shine upon you and be gracious to you. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. God, you're good. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless y'all. See y'all on Sunday.